This is the Southern Selkirk Mountains in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Older than the Rocky Mountains, it's here an almost impossible inland rainforest exists. In this remote area, lichen-covered trees live to be almost 2,000 years old. Made possible by the fact precipitation falls almost 100 days a year. And since we are as high as 8,000 feet, winters are long. With annual snowfall around 1,200 centimeters a year. In other words, not an easy place to survive. Yet for centuries, a shy and endangered animal has called this forest home. An almost mythical creature, so rarely seen, the locals call them the Grey Ghosts. And it's this story that caught the ear of local filmmaker Bryce Cormer. He wanted to tell their tale of survival to the world. However, the story he set out to tell would turn out very different than he ever could have imagined. Growing up as a kid, I, I always loved the bush in Australia. And that has never changed. I decided that I was going to be a woodworker or carpenter from when I was in kindergarten. I'm very passionate, I guess, in, in the way I go about things. Working with wood uh, has been there for a very long time now. Being able to look up at the, the mountains here and, and uh, it's beautiful. For me, it's, it's quite easy to go from full gas when I'm here in the workshop, trying to do things as fast as I possibly can. It's easy then to go up into the mountains and completely put the brakes on, just stop and relax and soak in everything that's up there. I slow down and appreciate what's up there. The outdoors here in Canada, I think one of the most beautiful parts of the world that I've ever seen. The story Bryce has been chasing is that of the southernmost mountain caribou herd in the world. This subspecies of caribou is so rare, it's now on the endangered list. So the idea of tracking and filming the small herd was not going to be an easy task. When I started out doing this film, it was just gonna be a, a short film. It certainly got similarities making a film and being a woodworker, but uh, very different. I went into it with this loose idea that I would make this film about this awesome conservation success story of these caribou. You know, with the idea that I could make some, you know, blue chip wildlife film. You know, being a passionate person, I think, it's easy to get drawn into the struggle that they're, they're going through. Got a little carried away and applied those same passions to, to making this film. And of course, in that nine years, things totally changed. What was once a herd of 50 plus animals was now less than three. In other words, his film about survival had quickly become a story about extinction. For the first two or three years, I guess, really, I, I, uh, I was fumbling my way through the forest looking for caribou. I didn't really know where and when to look for them. That I was up here for days and days and days in the hide of waiting and not seeing a thing. Finally, I, I had this incredible, magnificent bull come up and I filmed this guy for six minutes. I tell you, I, I don't know how many breaths I took during that six minutes, but it was very few and they were very shallow but my heart was just pounding out of my chest. It was, uh, it was an incredible experience, it really was, to be so close to this, to this magnificent animal and film it. A 
these are all just game trails through here. They're just everywhere. Yeah, obviously a lot of activity. Yeah, interestingly enough, since the caribou have dropped in numbers, the trails are far less well-defined. And I guess this is what they're after, isn't it? That is, yeah, the, the arboreal lichens, the tree lichens. It's amazing that an animal can make a living out of this. It just blows me away. These caribou have different traits and different ways they use their habitat. These caribou are unique and they're unique because of where they live and what they feed on. The caribou further north tend to feed on the, the terrestrial lichens, so the lichens that you see on the rocks and stuff like that on the ground. The southern mountain caribou tend to concentrate on the arboreal lichens. Because they grow up in the trees, they need a deep snowpack in the winter to actually reach these lichens. Now, most of it is so high up but I guess the snow level rises all winter long. Exactly, yeah. By mid-winter, the snowpack is well over our head. They'll stand on top of that and they can reach these lichens. But here's the twist. As Bryce was filming over the years, he began to realize the numbers of caribou were dropping. Something was happening and it wasn't good news. My experience was, was getting better and my knowledge was getting better, but the caribou were disappearing at, at such a rate that the number of shots that I was actually getting were fewer and fewer. It was a bit of a kick in the guts, really. I put so much effort into making this film. Originally, it was going to be a good, good story about it, and of course, that just turned right around to the point where I was struggling to get any footage of the caribou at all. I think the last year that I was filming, I think I got one shot of a caribou for the whole summer. Ultimately, the cause is really habitat loss. The number of roads that we have up here now, with all the logging, cut lines for, for power lines and gas lines. People ski touring up here and snowmobiling and packs the snow down. And it makes it much, much easier for the predators to travel to access the high country and the caribou. The whole issue of surrounding the caribou is important to me because it's, it's not just the caribou. It, it's a much bigger issue. The caribou are an indicator species. They give a good indication of the health of the ecosystem up here. When their numbers are, are dwindling, I think it's a very good indication that the habitat is not doing well, that the ecosystem is collapsing. To see that change so dramatically in the 10 years that I've been making this film, you know, it's sad. It's sad because that's it. They are the last two caribou in, in this area. And it's a sad reflection on what we have done. Ultimately, we're to blame for that. So the feel-good story Bryce set out to tell has turned out quite different. And recently, Bryce learned that the last two animals remaining are both females, which means it's very unlikely this herd will survive much longer. In other words, you are looking at the last of the southernmost herd of mountain caribou in the world. I want other people to see these animals before they're gone forever. If they all disappear, I'm going to really find that hard. I'd love to be able to bring the kids up here and, and show them the caribou. But realistically, chances of that ever happening are probably zero. The extirpation of this herd should really ring a bunch of alarm bells hopefully shake us awake from what we're doing, hopefully make us change our ways. I certainly hope it's a wake-up call. I really do, but time will tell, I guess.
I find it astounding to think that just at the headwaters of this creek in this beautiful old growth forest are the last two remaining caribou individuals of a once thriving population of highly specialized mountain caribou. And they're almost gone. And then I look at people like Bryce, who's working so hard to make sure the whole world realizes that caribou need to be protected. The caribou is so important to Canadians, it's even on our quarter. Now let's hope that we can learn from the mistakes that we've made in managing this population and that I won't be back talking about the demise of yet another herd of caribou.